Hello there. Obi-Wan Kenobi has just dropped its finale, and throughout this video we're going to be breaking down all the easter eggs, hidden details and things you missed. Last week had Roken and the Rebels fleeing into space, whilst Reva remained behind to try and strike down Vader. This backfired, and like the Grand Inquisitor, she ended up getting stabbed in the stomach, similar to how she was when she was a child. We actually had hints towards this wound all the way back in Episode 3 when she ended up getting slammed by Brother 5 and she touched it for a split second. It is possible that she had cybernetic parts placed into it, much like what we saw with Fennec Shand. These being stabbed again explains how she survived the encounter, and they act as somewhat of a means to an end all. <laughs> now this episode really wrestles with whether she's a friend or Poe, and come the end of the entry, they tied things up quite nicely without breaking the canon too much. But does it work? Well, we'll talk about it later on, but if you've been enjoying the breakdowns, we'd massively appreciate the thumbs up this one last time. We'll also be covering more Star Wars shows later in the air, so you will subscribe. Move along. Now with that out of the way, thanks for clicking this. Let's get into episode 6. Now we open on Tatooine and see two Jawas as well as a blue astromech droid, that's the same unit as R5 who would later get a bust up motivator on the planet. Motivators actually pop up again when we discover that the ship is struggling. Motivator shot. Here we see moisture dealers selling water in the street, and Reva ends up intervening on a guy who's just, just a bit of a jerk. Now this actually subtly hints that she's turning back to the light, as she's somewhat showing compassion to the locals by helping them out. Even if she's not specifically doing it for their best interests, she does sort of turn towards the end of the episode, which... Is it set up yet? I guess so. No, this was a big part of the Jedi Order, and maybe getting that Arkham Asylum death screen last week made her restart with a new take on life. Now in earlier breakdowns we talked about how Reva could likely be a play on the name Revan. This was a Jedi who ended up turning to the dark side much like she did. However, Revan also ended up going back to the light in the canonized ending, which is what we see happen here. Cut to the Devastator chasing the Partisan ship, which we learn is heading to Tessin. I don't believe this planet is featured in the saga before, and it's a refuge that sadly they don't think they'll make it to. Now Vader has of course searched Nier and Mustafar for Obi-Wan, and he's completely obsessed with taking him down and getting his revenge of the Sith. He's very much trying to use the reverse Uno card on him from their battle on Mustafar, and we've seen this throughout the show and the expanded lore. Episode 3 had him dragging him through the fire in order to burn him, and in the comics we even had a section where he dreamed about doing this on Mustafar. Now he's so fixated on Obi-Wan that he realises he'll leave the others alone if it means he gets him, and thus he ends up drawing him out to a deserted planet. The chase scene feels a lot more exciting than the dull one from The Last Jedi, and we actually see the struggle that they're going through and hopelessness that they feel. However, it's just the same plan as they have in that, so Star Wars is about to get some Now This episode is very much about Obi-Wan himself intervening in order to protect people, and he really lays his life on the line. We see that Obi-Wan also gives Leia Tala's holster, and it is possible that this is the same one she ended up wearing in Return of the Jedi, due to their similar design. This also popped up in the Princess Leia Age of Rebellion comic, and it's nice that they at least kinda tied it into that, and in many ways, Tala might have inspired her. Cut to Luke and Uncle Owen, who we learn as per usual, tired of your Luke mate, you're getting on me nerves. Now Luke's a kid who never hits the thumbs up button, always causes trouble, and one of these days, He's gonna get his auntie and uncle killed. Oh. He learns about Reva, and we see that Aunt Beru is played once more by Bonnie P.S., who also played the character in Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Obi-Wan tries to reach out to Qui-Gon, but he doesn't get a response. However, come the end of the entry, they finally reconnect, probably because the latter feels a bit awkward about getting everyone to train the person who destroyed the Jedi, even though they were all like, mate, don't do it, he's not a good kid. Now, the Grand Inquisitor really wants Vader to focus on the partisans, but as we discovered last week, Vader is often blinded by the thought of victory. Though he managed to sniff out Reva through doing this, it was still clearly his downfall, and something that Obi-Wan said would keep him as a Padawan until he overcame it. This could explain why in A New Hope he says that he was but a learner when he and Obi-Wan last met, and him finally dropping this makes him become a master. Vader decides to face him alone, but hey, you, you could have sent the Devastator after the Partisans and went for Obi-Wan yourself, but never mind. Now he flies in a shuttle, the same transport that we saw him riding in at the end of Empire and also at the start of Return of the Jedi. On the farm, Luke says, I'm not afraid. I know. Which is of course playing on him saying it in The Empire Strikes Back. I'm not afraid. Yeah. You will be. 
Vader and Obi-Wan come face to face, but he refuses to run away like he did in Episode 3, and interestingly, everyone was saying that he darted for the high ground. Vader says, Have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? Potentially playing on him saying the opposite to Luke in The Empire Strikes Back. Don't make me destroy you. He also says, Then you will die. Which is a line that the character said in Rebels. Then you will die. Similar to this, his mask also gets split later on, exposing some of his face and finally showing us Hayden in the suit. Through this, we can hear both Hayden and James Earl Jones dubbing lines over each other, which was how his dialogue played out in Rebels. These quotes might actually not be nods to them, but hey, we like our reach here at the channel, so moving on. Now, Obi-Wan ends up drawing his lightsaber, and he adopts the stance that we've seen him take at several points in his life, with the blade up by his head whilst he extends his other arm. This has appeared a number of times throughout the franchise, and it's sort of like poetry, they rhyme. Now, the pair duke it out, and unlike their last fight, there's no lava here to fall into. Great battle of them just going all out, and it's nicely juxtaposed by the more solitary and stealthy scenes that are happening with Reva. Owen actually holds his own against her, and you can kind of see why Obi-Wan trusted him to raise the child. This is mirrored in Obi-Wan, who still holds back when fighting Vader. Ever since he left him to die on Mustafar, he's shown that he's actually unable to deal a full killing blow to him, and this was of course seen in Episode 3, and A New Hope, in which he sacrificed himself. I think he does this because deep down he believes Anakin can be redeemed and thus he doesn't want to kill him and put a stop to that potentially happening. Obi-Wan gets buried under rocks and making them levitate is one of the first things that a Jedi learns. This shows the very base reactions to him and he ends up burying the character lower than the audience scores for the show on Rotten Tomatoes. He also calls him Master which doesn't break canon as he refers to himself as one in A New Hope. Now whilst they're fighting I thought I'd just Drop a quick correction on last week's video. We said that we thought this took place after Attack of the Clones because Anakin was looking at Padme's penthouse, which he wouldn't know belonged to her unless they met or he was a crazy stalker. However, due to the lightsaber that he carries here being destroyed in the factory and also the fact that he still has his hand, it's set either early on in Attack of the Clones or just before it. Still can't explain why he looks like a 45 year old man, but there was also a hidden Mickey Mouse head in the scene. You can see it here. Yeah? And those some of the bitches at Disney, I'll never forgive them. Ah, oh, sh. Here we go again. Anyway, back on the farm, Reva badly busts up Owen and Baru, which makes Luke flee into the desert. He never actually sees the lightsaber in the episode, and this keeps up the canon as Obi Wan had to explain to him what one was in A New Hope. Later on, he gets knocked out, so he's unconscious when she draws it, and this was something I theorized that they kind of had to do in order to mess up what would come. Now under the rocks, Obi-Wan hears lines from Anakin and their previous battle, and initially it seems that these somewhat push him into fueling his anger. However, he ends up channeling his thoughts of Luke and Leia, which empowers him to finally concentrate on the good and lift the rocks. He later builds up an array of these that he fires like bullets. Lots of flashes to the ending of Last Jedi here, and again this calls back to basic Jedi training in which they use their feelings. This helps him overpower Vader, and it leaves him breathing heavily like how he was when he was wounded in Return of the Jedi. After his helmet is split like Ryan Airy's mum bit down too hard, he ends up denying that he's Anakin. Obi-Wan described him as being more machine than man now, and this voice distortion and machinery that surrounds him adds to why the character felt this way. Obi-Wan apologises for letting him down, but Vader says that he killed Anakin. In A New Hope, Obi-Wan of course told Luke that his father was killed by Darth Vader, and he later explained this as being the case from a certain point of view. This line very much adds to this notion that it was Vader who killed Anakin, and unable to deal the killing blow once more, he ends up doing a Craig David. Not gonna lie, it did feel kinda like fanfiction at points where they over explain things, and I think the writing is what really let the show down. Now as he leaves the planet, he senses that Luke is in danger, and we cut to Reva standing over him about to strike down. However, she very much sees herself in him, and refuses to deal the killing blow once more. Obi-Wan arrives and he mentions the Dune Sea, a location that was brought up in A New Hope. Reva returns with the boy alive, and it turns out that she's redeemed herself. Spent several years cutting down kids, but just like how Vader murdered millions and then turned against the Emperor, all is forgiven Space Hitler. She of course knows the secret of Luke, and for some reason, Obi-Wan decides to take the chance of letting her live after she drops her lightsaber. Guessing she's gonna go off and get her own spin-off show, and in the leaks it did say that she was originally meant to be killed, but that they reshot things 
and now she's fine and dandy. Now this idea of burying the handle in the sand was very much seen as a way of shutting oneself off from the force. Obi-Wan dug his lightsaber up earlier in the season, and Rey of course did it for Luke and Leia at the end of Rise of Skywalker. Excuse me there kind sir, perhaps you could spare a minute to talk about our intergalactic lord and saviour, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Just saying mate yeah, our pals over at Epic Hero Shop have a Kenobi collection going on right now, with lots of t-shirts, art prints and more on the character. Not getting paid for this yeah, just want to show some love to them as they've been big supporters of the channel, and I wear this stuff a lot, and this is really the last chance you have to get your hands on some merch from them. They've got great ones like a lightsaber schematic t-shirt, an Obi-Wan stained glass window collection, a NASA Space Wars hoodie that has a translation of NASA and Arabesh, and lots of other stuff. Head over to them chumps, you punk, at epicheroshop.com. That's epicheroshop.com, you damn chump. See ya chump. From here we cut to Mustafar and get a cameo by Ian McDermott, who is once more reprising his role as Palpatine. He questions whether his feelings are clear on the matter and if he's potentially returned to serving Obi-Wan. The Sith were notorious for back and front stabbing each other, so him overthrowing Palps would be a big worry. This of course ended up being revealed as his plan in Empire Strikes Back and just like how Reva wanted to kill her master and Vader, Vader also wanted to oust the Emperor with his son. This kind of leads me into the next point with Palps, and I also think he's probe droiding to see if he knows about his kids. Now Vader was completely unaware that he had kids at this point, as Palpatine told him they died along with Padme. It was something that pushed him further down the dark path he was on, but he did eventually learn that Luke was his son after the events of A New Hope. In the comics we discover that Vader was extremely curious over who had blown up the battle station, and he hired both Boba Fett and Black Crescenton to carry out jobs for him. Fett was tasked with discovering the identity of the pilot, and after he told him the surname, Darth put two and two together and figured it all out. This show keeps the info separate from him, and it also hides the fact that Leia is his child too. We cut to Leia's home and see Aldez right instead of Aldez wrong. <laughs> that, that's the worst point we've ever dropped. Just unsubscribe, mate. I don't even blame you. I don't like heavy spoilers. Anyway, she gets herself ready this time instead of the servants doing it like how they would have in episode one. This shows her independence and she knows how she wants to lead from now on and as we saw in the sequel trilogy, she did become a fearless leader. Obi-Wan says he will help the Organas again if they need it and this would of course be why Leia reaches out to him. Really nice goodbye between Leia and Obi-Wan, just a shame she never remembers this and was like, you serve my dad mate. I have never met this man in my life. Now Obi-Wan brings up her parents and says that she carries the best qualities of both Anakin and Padme. In episode 3, we did discuss how he acknowledged the similarities with Padme, but I also said a lot of her qualities were down to Anakin too. It's nice that they acknowledged there was good in him, and this would of course lead to his redemption. Back home, Obi-Wan ends up donning his white robes that he had in the original and prequel trilogy. Later on, he puts his coat over this, and this is actually what he wore in Star Wars issue 15, which was centered around his adventures on Tatooine. This series has cherry-picked moments from that, including the gift he gave to Luke being destroyed by Owen, and also the fact that he watched over the boy. He ends up allowing Luke to grow up as a normal boy, that works 80 hours a week doing backbreaking farm work, and he implies Owen has become a powerful mentor. He's very much a Jonathan Kent type figure who wants what's best for the boy, but he doesn't want to force him to become Superman. Now at this point Luke is given the T-16 toy, which Owen of course ended up breaking in episode 1. This toy also appeared in A New Hope when we could see Luke playing with it during his time with the droids in the first act. There's very much this hopeful feeling to the ending and we know from the path and lightsabers that we saw in last week that the Jedi weren't completely wiped out after the events of Order 66. We are yet to meet them all but the names on the wall made it clear that several survived and they're out there in the galaxy. Obi-Wan also drops a hello there. Hello there. Out in the desert the ghost of Qui-Gon begins to form and I love how he's just kind of moseying about. Now Qui-Gon is attached to the living force and this is how he was able to come back and communicate with the Jedi. Force ghosts were never really in the prequel trilogy which seemed a bit off as there were thousands and thousands of dead Jedi but absolutely none of them reached out to any of the others. Looking at the biggest story of Qui-Gon, he was someone that understood that the force went past life and death and that it existed inside everything and everyone. Upon death he came to realize that he didn't have an individual existence and instead he just became part of the force. Though he thought this was a better kind of existence, due to the petty squabbles that the living had, he did still have fond memories of the living world and wished to return to it. After death he started to train his consciousness to go back there, and he managed to leave the unity of the Force in order to commune with the living. 
He actually guided Yoda on Dagobah and helped him to gain his own form of immortality through becoming one with the living force. In the expanded lore, Qui-Gon initially only existed as a voice, however, as he drew on memories of his life, his robes started to form around him and eventually he took shape, appearing like the body that he once had. He says he's always been there, Obi-Wan just wasn't ready to see, and he will help further train him to master his abilities and become a ghost like he did. Obi-Wan rides off on the back of his EOP as the twin sons of Tatooine bear down on him, and this iconography is something that we've of course seen throughout the entire saga. Titled Binary Sunset, it's something that Lucas and co used to show everything is sort of like poetry they write. Now Luke first looked over the sunset all the way back in A New Hope, and then Owen and Beru did it at the end of Revenge of the Sith. This was then carried out by Rey at the end of Rise of Skywalker, and it's used here to bring the series to a close. Pretty solid episode, I just felt the writing let it down a bit, but these closing scenes really elevated it for me. Lots of powerful and impactful moments, and great goodbyes that tease what will come down the line. Now as for my thoughts on the series, I am kinda torn on it in all honesty. I feel there's a lot of great moments in it, but there's also some really stupid character choices and things that they do at certain points in the series that knock it down a couple of notches. Every episode has had its strong points, but I feel that the true conflict of the show should have been between Vader and Obi-Wan, which wasn't really explored all that in depth until episode 5. I think the marketing team for the series knew that that was what people wanted to see in the show the most as well, which is why Hayden and Ewan were both heavily featured in interviews for the series. Their relationship, the fact Obi-Wan is protecting his kids, and in some ways now their father figure, would have added more interesting dynamics to it, but instead, their fight it kind of feels a bit like a footnote. Now I do feel that Moses Ingram was a good villain, and her story was clearly given the most thought throughout the series. However, even then, I feel a lot of the more interesting things got left out, and with them going in the direction of putting her as the main bad guy, I think we should have had more focus on her backstory. It could have showed us how she survived the temple, her training with the Inquisitors, and also her turn to the dark side, which we didn't really get yet. Like I said, I think the focus should have been on Vader and Obi-Wan, but considering they didn't do that, I also don't think they really knocked it out of the park either with who they chose to put the focus on. I also think the 6 episode format Disney seems to be stuck on has a lot of issues in general and it doesn't really give us enough time to properly explore everything like a 10 episode TV show would. We have a pretty similar plot to A New Hope here where we're basically getting a rescue mission on Leia, meeting a scoundrel that turns out to be good, breaking into an imperial fortress to save her, escaping, getting tracked by the Empire and having a big battle. However, it feels like they do less than a 2 hour movie even though they have a lot more time. If you watch a TV show like The Boys and see what they do in 6 episodes, how many characters they fully develop, and where they take them and then compare it to this, it just seems really simplistic. Now as for the good, I think Ewan really nailed it in terms of doing the old weathered, out of the game character that we've seen become a motif in the last couple of decades. Unforgiven and Logan both handled it really well, and though The Last Jedi failed in it, I think Obi-Wan was handled expertly as they showed him growing as a character throughout it. There were also some big action set pieces that I think worked really well, such as the fight in episode 3, and all the scenes with Vader really captured how threatening of a villain he is. I've talked about this in depth, and I think for all the hang-ups I have with Disney's handling of Star Wars, that they've at least nailed their most important character in him. I also really like Tala and the Inquisitors, especially Brother 5. Again, I just wish that we had more. Overall, I think the show is good, it's just not great, and for a property like Obi-Wan, that's what I was hoping for. With a second season potentially in the works, I'd love to see Lucasfilm take a look at what worked and what didn't, and give the show the space it needs to develop proper storylines. In the end, I don't hate what we got, I just wanted a little bit more, and that's why it gets a 7 out of 10. Now, I'd of course love to hear your thoughts, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We are running a competition right now, giving away 3 copies of Everything Everywhere all at once on the 15th of July, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the series. We pick the comments at random on the 15th, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want some else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the boys, which will be linked on screen right now. We've gone over all the easter eggs in the latest episode, so definitely head over there right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.